So we find ourselves on a snow day, and you know me, I still need to teach some calculus. It's my thing. So today, I'm going to try and talk about definite integrals and specifically accumulation functions. Let's see if we can make any headway with this. During our discussion of the fundamental theorem of calculus, we constructed a function that would, that would calculate the area under a curve over a specific interval. And I'm going to sort of recreate that situation here uh, so I can describe to you what an accumulation function is. So let's say that this function here happens to be the derivative of f. In other words, this function plots the change in f. It's a plot of the slopes, essentially. Well, we make an accumulation function by starting at some point a, just like we did in our discussion of the fundamental theorem, and then introducing a variable x, which is some distance away from a, and calculating that area. In other words, we're accumulating change. And we know that the expression for that function is a definite integral, or excuse me, that area is a definite integral. Okay? So if I write down the integral, let's see if I can do this. Remember, I do these in one take, so it is what it is. I'm just hitting some buttons here that you can't see, trying to draw an integral symbol. There it is. If I write down the definite integral from a to x of this function, which happens to be f prime of t dt, and what you just heard in the background there was my wife walking in on me making this video, um, I switched to variable t because x has a specific purpose in our uh, accumulation function, right? It's the, it's the x coordinate on the t axis. So this is f prime of t dt that we're integrating. The area under the curve from a to x is this definite integral. And if I move x around, I get different values. Well, what this is doing is this is adding up the change in f. It's accumulating the change in the function. And what we typically use this for is to find the actual expression for f of x. And what we need to know is we need to know the initial and initial value of the function. In our case, I would like to know what f of a is. And if I do know that, I should be able to write an expression for f of x using this model. It is f of whatever a is plus any change that happens from a. And this formula is going to be useful for us, especially in some of the AP test questions. If I want to find an expression for f of x, I take an initial value f of a, and then I integrate from that point um, to whatever x value I'm looking for. You integrate the derivative. Okay. The key here is that the derivative is the function that we have a graph of or that we know. If we can integrate the derivative plus add on that initial value, we can get an expression for f of x. What I'm going to do on the next slide is I'm just going to verify that this formula works. Oh, I'm making a mess here. I'm going to verify that this formula works, and then I'm going to show you um, a specific example from an actual AP question um, where we use this idea. And typically there is usually an accumulation problem in the free response section of the AP test. So let's check out that example that will verify that this works. So what we're going to try and do is verify that this formula that I introduced on the last screen, f of x equals f of a plus the definite integral from a to x of f prime of t dt. We're going to, we want to verify that this thing works. So let's take a known example. For, for instance, uh, how about this cubic? Now, typically you're not given the actual function, but I want to verify that this thing works. So I'm going to use a function that I know, which happens to be x cubed 
uh, plus 3x squared minus 4. And I think you'll agree that the derivative of that thing, f prime of x, is, uh, what would that be? Um, how about 3x squared plus 6x? And later we'll use f prime of t, which, you know, we just place, replace the t with the, or the x with the t. So it would be 3, uh, this is an x here, 3t squared. I'm rushing, so my handwriting is extra bad right now. I'll slow down a little bit. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with, um, let's say, a equals 2. That's a value that we can quickly compute and then use to verify that my formula works. So I think you'll agree that f of 2 is 8 plus, what is that, 12 minus 4, which is 16, right? So if my formula produces the value... Uh, excuse me. Now, that's our A. I'm getting ahead of myself. I think you'll also agree that we can quickly compute f of 4. Um, this will be what we're going to base our answer on. So f of 4 is something like, what is this, 64 plus 3 times 60, 48 minus 4. That's going to be 108. Okay, so if my function produces 108 for f of 4, knowing that f of 2 is 16, then we are on the right track. Okay, so I'm going to put 2 here for a and here for a, and I'll put f prime of t here, and we'll see if we get 108 for the answer. And hopefully I can squeeze it in on the bottom of this screen here. So f of 4, that's what we're trying to compute with my top formula. Remember, I'm computing it with this formula. Okay. F of 4 would be f of a, which we said was 16, plus the definite integral from 2 to x, which was 4, of f prime of t, which was 3t squared, plus 6t. Oh my goodness. And as you can see, I'm going to run out of space here, so I will move to the next slide. But if this value is 108, then I will have verified that my formula works. And then I'm going to show you how we use it in that AP question. Okay, let's finish this example off here. So on that previous slide, I had f of 4 equals 16 plus the definite integral from 2 to 4 of, what was that, 3t squared plus 6t dt. And we know how to evaluate this definite integral because of the fundamental theorem. That's going to be 16 plus um, this antiderivative is uh, t cubed plus 3t squared. And we're going to evaluate that 2 to 4. Okay, so a little bit more math here. 16 plus, when I plug in 4, I get something like 64 plus 48. And then I've got my minus sign from the fundamental theorem. And then when I plug in 2, I get something like 8 plus 12. Let's just double check this uh, t squared. That's 4. 3 is 12. Yeah, we get that. Okay. And when you add all this up, believe it or not, it does equal 108. So I'm showing you this to verify that my accumulation formula from a few slides ago, f of x equals f of a, which would be some known value that we have to know. We have to know a y value, an initial value. And then we can add on the accumulation of change from that value a to some other point x that we're trying to find if we do the definite integral on the derivative. So I was just verifying that this formula does produce 
the Y value that we expect to get. Now, remember, I was working with a known function so I could verify that this works. What happens in the AP test and on other problems is that we know something about the derivative and we need to work backwards to find the function. And we're going to use this accumulation to help us do that. So let me run through uh, a real sample uh, AP problem and hopefully you'll see that this does work. So here goes my real AP test question. This is a free response question where we're not allowed to use a calculator. You can see that we're given the graph of function g and notice that g is the derivative of f. That's kind of a big deal. So just as I'm working on this problem, I make a note to myself that g, oops, wrong thing. Let me get rid of that funky g and let me put a real g here. G is f prime. G is the derivative. So it's going to match up with uh, f prime of t in the problem that I just did. Okay, so you can see that the derivative here is graphed. And the first thing we're asked to do right out of the gate, right out of the gate, we are asked to find the value of f of negative 5. We are trying to find f of negative 5, and we have a known quantity, which is the y value, uh, f of 1, which is 3. So we know that f of 1 is 3. In other words, they're letting me know that my a is 3. Okay, so here's how I go about doing letter a of this AP problem. It's the response for letter a. I want to know what f of negative 5 is. And I'm going to write an accumulation formula to help me with that. f of negative 5 is going to be f of 1. I put a equals 3. Man, that was wrong. You guys have probably waited the last uh, minute or so to yell at me. Um, a is 1. The value of f of a is 3. Sorry about that. That won't be the last mistake I make in this problem, just so you know. Okay, let's try this again. Uh, f of 1 is 3, so I'm going to start at 3, and then from there I need to add up, add on all the change that happens between 3 and negative 5. So that is a definite integral. It goes from a, our initial value, to negative 5, and we are going to find the uh, area under the curve of g of x, which is f, uh, g of t, we'll say, which is really our f prime of t, right? So in this problem, this is the formula that will give us the accumulation of change. And right away, I do notice that I have um, some interesting limits of integration here. The definite integral for the area is going to go to, from left to right if I want to uh, add that change up. So what we're going to do is just rewrite this expression with a minus sign. I'm going to put a minus in there and then switch the limits of integration. We'll go from negative 5 to 1 of g of t. Okay. Now, between negative 5 and 1, I don't know anything about this function. Up here in the description, they do give me a formula for 3 to 6. They tell me the formula of the parabola. So yeah, I do know the formula of the parabola. It's right here. But our area that we're worried about is over here. All of these things are uh, polygons, so we can add up the area. So essentially, to get the value of this function, what I need to do is take the 3 and then subtract the areas that I have in this picture. So the first area that I see is a rectangle right here. And since it's below the x-axis, that is a, a negative 9. Right? The next area I see is this triangle right here. I'll make it green. And that is, what, 1 times 3 times a half, so that's 3 over 2. That's also negative. And then the last piece I see, and we'll do in red, is this little area right here. And that's the triangle 1 times 2 times a half, which is just 1. So plus 1. All right, now I'm working uh, upward here to get this value. But when you do 3 minus negative 9 minus 3 halves, sorry, the handwriting again is bad, 
but you know me, I'm not doing another take on this thing. Um, and you compute this. This is going to be 3. Come on, baby. Oops. You don't have anything better to do on a snow day than watch me screw up my math, right? I do 3, and then I'm going to um, subtract what ends up being uh, negative 19 over 2. So I'm going to add 19 over 2, which is 25 over 2, or 12 and a half. The answer for g of negative, or f of negative 5, excuse me, f of negative 5, is 25 over 2. And yes, that is the answer on the AP solution as well. So to find f of negative 5, we had to use that accumulation process. The only thing we knew about this function was that f of 1 was 3, and we knew that we had the graph of the derivative. In order to get function values off the graph of the derivative, we have to use integration, right? Uh, an accumulation function. So we found out how much change happened from the y value 3. Turns out it was 19 over 2. And so we add that part on, and that gives us f of negative 5. Okay, let's answer the rest of these choices, even though they don't all specifically apply to accumulation. In letter B, we just got to compute the definite integral of, uh, from 1 to 6 of g of x dx. I'm going to try writing this over here and see if that gives me a little more room. And so, basically, I see that this graph is really divided into two pieces. Again, it's the, it's the parabola over here and then all these geometric shapes on this side. So we ought to be able to break this into two pieces and then um, get, the, get the area. Because we're really only going from 1 to 3 and then 3 to 6, right? So we'll use a little um, definite integral um, addition here, and then we'll break this into two pieces. So I think you'll agree that the definite integral from 1 to 6 of g of x, oopsie, Sorry, I'm wasting your time. Let's try this again. The definite integral from 1 to 6 of g of x, this is additivity we call this, g of x dx, equals the definite integral from 1 to 3 of g of x, and I'm not having any room over here, plus the integral from 3 to 6 of g of x dx. Now I can just do a little counting to figure out the area uh, from 1 to 3. That's just 4 units. So when I compute this thing, it's really 4 plus the definite integral from 3 to 6. And from 3 to 6, I do know the expression for g of x. It's 2 times uh, x minus 4 squared. And so we can compute this definite integral just using the fundamental theorem. Uh, in fact, we might want to do a little bit of u substitution because this is a um, composition, but I'm pretty good at these in my head these days, so I can simply um, write down the antiderivative and then plug the values in. Pause it if you need to go through the process of uh, computing the antiderivative. This would be 2 thirds times x minus 4 cubed, and we're going to evaluate that from 3 to 6. So this definite integral will have a value of 4 plus, and then we'll plug in our values. Uh, when we plug in 6, you do a little math, you're going to get 16 thirds. And then when you plug in 3, you do a little math, you're going to get minus negative 2 thirds. And so believe it or not, this whole thing works out to be 10. And again, I've run out of space. But for letter B, the answer to this problem is 10 when you add these up. 18 thirds is 6 plus 4 is 10. Okay, that's letter B. Let's see if we can wrap this thing up with letters C and D, and we'll get this video over with. In letter C, they're going to make us think a little bit. We are asked to find on this open interval from negative 5 to 6, so essentially, on the entire graph, what open intervals, if any, is the graph of f? Remember, this is not f. This is f prime. 
but we're asking about the graph of f. Where is f both increasing and concave up? And we need to give a reason for our answer, okay? So when you're answering these, you want to try and write in a complete sentence that makes sense in English. Show that you know what you're talking about. So I might say something like this. On the open interval, negative 5, 6, F is both increasing... And I get to use fancy colors because I have this neat little toy. And concave up on. And then we're going to figure this out. So here's the deal. Um, since this is the graph of the derivative, we know that the function f is increasing when um, the graph of the derivative is above the x-axis. So we're increasing over here. Okay. Now, we also need to know where this function is concave up, and that is where the second derivative is increasing. And you'll notice there are two spots on this graph where the derivative of the derivative, in other words, the slope of the derivative, is positive, and that would be here on 0, 1, and here on 4, 6. So my answer for this problem is 0, 1, and 4, 6. But I also have to tell why. So I'll say something like, because, and Hopefully you won't have to do your AP test on this device because it's hard to write on. Uh, but the because is because g of x is greater than 0 and g prime of x is greater than 0. Right? The derivative, or you could say something about the slope of g, is positive on those two intervals. Because this thing is above the x-axis and its slope is positive on 0, 1, and 4, 6, we know that the function f is increasing and concave up. Okay, let's knock letter D out and this video will be done. Whoopsie. I'm going to get the right thing going here. Oh, goodness. I probably should start over, but I'm not going to. We're going to ride this thing out. We've made it this far with all the mistakes and whatnot. Okay, so we're trying to find the x-coordinate for each point of inflection. And we have to give a reason for our answer again. So remember, inflection points happen where the second derivative changes sign, where the second derivative changes from positive to negative. Since this is the graph of the derivative, we are looking at the slopes of this graph to see where they change. And the slope here is change signs. So it can't just change from 0 to positive. It's got to change from positive to negative or negative to positive. So here we're 0. Here we're positive. Here we're 0. Here we're positive. Here we're 0. Here we're negative. And then here we're positive. So the only place where it changes, where the second derivative changes from negative to positive, is at x equals 4. Okay? Now we just have to write a coherent sentence in some kind of handwriting that we can read to explain that. So we might say something like, the inflection point, because there's only one, at least on this interval, the inflection point of f of x has an x-coordinate, oops, let's spell the word has correctly, dude. What, it has an x-coordinate of 4. Let's just put, occurs at x equals 4. How's that sound? That's the x-coordinate. And 
And the because is, or the reason is, the slope of G changes from negative to positive there. And as I explained up here in the picture, uh, you can see that the slope was negative here, it's positive here, so x equals 4 has to be an inflection point. Okay, so thanks for hanging in there on this one. Um, I wanted to tell you about accumulation, but it was also a good chance for us to uh, practice uh, a real um, AP test question, uh, sort of putting together a bunch of concepts that we have been working with over the last several months. I'm going to have you try one of these uh, tonight, and then hopefully we'll see you tomorrow. Take care.